it's nice to be here. Uh, I'm Jared Ponchat, uh, and my colleague Jen Wachowski is also going to be speaking. Um, uh, we've we're both designers, uh, as he said, at a company called Lullabot, we're, where we've been working together now for several years, actually. Um, Lullabot is a strategy design and development agency with a legacy of expertise in Drupal and large-scale CMS projects. Um, these days, we sort of specialize in problems at the intersection of large-scale content management and design systems work. Um, and if you're not familiar with Drupal, which is going to be at least a part of what we're, we're talking about here, Drupal is an open source CMS. Uh, it's been around since 2001. Uh, it's known by many as, sort of, uh, as a content management framework as much as a CMS because it's very, very flexible. It's sort of like Legos for building the web. Um, and it's known for being able to handle complex content models. Uh, it's one of the first uh, content management systems that took a very content centric as opposed to a page centric approach to, uh, to websites. Um, Drupal has what's called themes, which is what powers like what a site looks like and how things are templated and laid out and styled and all that. Um, and Drupal has a default theme. It's called Bartik. It was a project that start, was started by Jen Simmons. Uh, and that project started about 10 years ago, actually. So the out of the box theme in Drupal is a design that's 10 years old currently. Um, these are my colleagues, Putra and Mike, Putra Bonacorsi and Mike Herschel. Uh, they're both uh, front end developers in their background, at least. Uh, Putra is now a technical project manager at Lullabot as well. Um, but they actually came up with the idea for this project early on. Uh, they were having a conversation at DrupalCon Seattle, which is sort of the annual American conference that happens for the Drupal community. Um, and they were having a conversation about what constitutes a great CMS theme. Uh, and that conversation led Putra and Mike to wonder at the fact that there was no project going on to create a new theme as Drupal 9 was being in development. So uh, that got them started. And then also at that DrupalCon, uh, Dries Beuthardt, who's the founder of Drupal, uh, he's the project lead, he gives a, an annual keynote address. And in his keynote, he talked about how uh, while experts still love Drupal, beginners or CMS newcomers especially still have some negative connotations. And a key aspect of that is just the fact that the out of the box experience includes a theme design that's a decade old. Um, so Putra and Mike started creating a few just really simple goals. What got them excited about maybe working on a new theme? And they captured those. They talked about having an updated modern design. They wanted a theme that felt more current, uh, potentially could last for another five years. They wanted functionality in the theme that could support Drupal's new features that have emerged over the last decade. And above all, actually, they wanted um, top-notch accessibility compliance. Uh, Drupal now has very stringent standards for accessibility and they wanted to make sure that Drupal's default theme uh, met those standards. So that got them thinking that they needed to pull a team together to work on it. They reached out to Jen, Jen reached out to me and away we went. We started the process and Jen and I began pretending like we knew how to do a theme project for a large scale CMS. Um, the work that Jen and I typically do is for clients. Um, and so uh, this was a different kind of an undertaking. So this talk, we're gonna to attempt to answer a handful of things. We're gonna first, who are we? Why did we do this? How did we do this? What would we say we did here? <laughs> and then, um, and also you're all the way here already. So this is good news. Um, and we're gonna to try to leave some space at the end to hopefully answer some questions if you have any. Um, I want to start by framing just some of the unique challenges that we faced right out of the gate. Um, so two key questions among others for any design project, especially with client projects like what we typically work on is who's the audience we're designing for and who are our stakeholders? They're fundamental things that any design process uh, that we take on you know, we have to have these answers. Typically, it's not actually hard to answer this for the kinds of projects we do. But when you're designing a theme that anyone can use for nearly any kind of site that they're making with an open source CMS, how you define things like the audience you're designing for and what approval processes will look like and that kind of stuff is tricky to say the least. 
how you solve for this can create new problems in your process. And there are two potentially alluring approaches uh, to this problem that are actually each problematic. So I want to talk about those and, and kind of why we were trying to avoid them. Um, the first problematic approach is just to try to include everything for anyone, thereby making it unwieldy and unusable for everyone. Um, we knew we couldn't just include everything. The needs are too varied and we wanted to find some way to have some focus as we began creating together. Uh, the second problematic approach is to design for the average and then thereby wind up designing for no one specifically. It's sometimes known as the average man problem. And if you're not familiar with this, you know, back in World War II, we came to grips with the fact that we had spent decades designing and building aircraft uh, cockpits and controls for what the Air Force was calling the average man. Uh, there's a really great backstory to this that's fascinating. It goes way back to the first astronomers and the American Civil War. And uh, if you're interested, there, there, there's a podcast called 99% Invisible. They have an episode called On Average that tells that story. There's also a great book called The End of Average. Uh, really fascinating stuff. But to sum it up, by World War II, what the Air Force began realizing was that they were taking the averages of all Air Force personnel to do approximations of things like the average height, weight, arm length, et cetera. And they had actually designed and built airplane cockpits around this. It, but it turned out that no one pilot actually matched any of these averages. And it led to design thinking behind modern cockpits that we have now, where now we have things like adjustable seats and yokes and pedals. They didn't actually have that in these planes. They were having lots of planes go down in World War II because of this, actually. Um, in designing Olivero, we also had to figure out um, what features and controls would need to be adjustable, if you will. Um, so what was our approach? So Jen's gonna get into more specifics in terms of the actual things that we did. And I'm gonna try to really quickly just talk about our high level approach and philosophy. So first we established some design principles. And this helped us define success in a way that was easy to remember and could hold true almost regardless of what we learned about our audience and stakeholders as we went along. Um, and our principles were pretty simple. We wanted to, above all, have something that was simple. We wanted to avoid unnecessary visual elements, colors, effects, and complexity. We wanted something modern, something that would take advantage of the capabilities and strengths of modern browsers that were definitely not being leveraged in a 10-year-old theme. Uh, we wanted something focused, so we wanted to embrace high contrast, saturated color, and negative space, and draw the eye to what's most important, design defaults for the 80%. Um, and we wanted something flexible. Uh, we wanted to provide options and overrides to account for varied needs and preferences. And then we worked to zero in on what could we actually say about this audience we were designing for and the sites that they would make with this theme. Um, when you're designing a default theme for an open source CMS, there's an ocean of things that you just can't know about the people who are going to eventually use the theme. But there were a few things we thought were actually safe to say. So we knew that these were going to be people who were probably new to Drupal. Um, we knew that they were probably not going to have a lot of programming or design skills. If they're using a default out of the box themes, these are usually people who either don't have the resources or skills to actually create their own. And because of this, they're probably also going to be using default content uh, types and whatnot that come with Drupal. So they'd have a simpler content model. Uh, but despite all that, they were going to have varied content. So the length of things like titles and labels and in different languages and uh, the sort of number of menu items, these kinds of things could vary wildly. So next we worked to try to figure out who the stakeholders were. How would the design process work? We needed to answer questions like, who are our stakeholders? Who's going to provide feedback when and how? what do we want from them? Like what kind of feedback are we looking for from them and can these people provide it? Uh, and what will approval look like? You know, who's going to approve which designs and how? I already mentioned the challenge of our real stakeholders being lots of people with uh, all kinds of needs that we couldn't know who would eventually use the theme. Uh, and a broad Drupal community as well. Drupal has a massive community of developers who contribute to it as a lot of open source projects do. 
but we need to figure out some way to rein this in a bit. So our approach was to first establish a proxy group. We assembled a group of various core maintainers who had a lot of knowledge around different aspects of what could get into Drupal core, as well as some designers and developers who were willing to work on the project with us. Um, and these were people who could help us review and refine at the beginning of the process. So the goal here was to do as much due diligence as possible to weed out as many potential issues with our design ideas as possible so that we could put something a bit more refined in front of the larger community for feedback. And next, we just tested and continued to iterate. We had a lot of help from this proxy group with things like accessibility testing along the way. And we were able to do a lot of refinement and weed out a lot of problems before we wasted a broader community's time with these kinds of things. And we knew we wanted to eventually engage the broader community for feedback. So we worked to define the kind of feedback we were looking for and then what our timeline targets were going to be before we actually published it to the whole community. Once we'd done a good bit of refinement in the design process and defined the kind of feedback we were looking for from the broader community, we published our progress. Uh, we did this on drupal.org, which is kind of where the community goes to hash things out. And uh, we began iterating based on the feedback that trickled in. Uh, one thing that felt like a real success was that the community feedback didn't feel like some onslaught of problems and bugs and complaints. It was actually pretty straightforward and the community provided really great insights and helped catch a few things that hadn't been caught and helped our designs get closer to done. Um, so that was kind of a flyover of some of the key challenges we faced in our overarching process. But the really fun stuff is what we actually did within that process. Like, how did we identify the look and feel we wanted to achieve? And how did we collaborate to refine and establish that look and feel? And, and what were the designs like along the way? So now for the more exciting part, my colleague Jen Witkowski is going to jump in and actually share some of those details. So this is where it gets fun. Jen, do you want to hear? Let me try to stop the screen share and pass it over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so let me uh, share my keynote here. Awesome. I hope everybody's seeing my screen. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the design process. Um, I'd love to walk you through how we approached the visual design for Olivero um, and how we finalized the design system. Um, so our big question was, what are we designing? What did the theme have to do? Um, so it was important for us to understand the scope and restrictions of the project and what we could change versus things that were nice to have versus things we couldn't even touch. Um, and we worked closely with developers, uh, specifically Mike and Putra, uh, to achieve this. Uh, so what we did is we created a list that captured all the components and reviewed them with developers to fully understand what we could and could not change. Um, we also captured all the different ways that the components could appear. So what we did is we started off with Bartik as a base. Um, and we went in and took a bunch of screenshots of all the components that appear in Bartik. Um, and we assembled them into a document and then went through uh, each component and uh, discussed whether or not it had to be included in the design system. Uh, it was nothing fancy. Uh, we actually used a Dropbox paper doc, uh, as you can see here. Uh, but it helped us better understand what we were overall designing for. Once we had the list of components, um, what we did is we created really quick wireframes uh, to review with Mike and Putra just to ensure that we had captured all the important bits that came out of our discussion. So once we felt like we were in a good place with component documentation, uh, we were able to start the visual phase. Uh, one thing to note is that we were our proxy group or our stakeholders. Um, I may go back and forth between stakeholders and proxy group. Um, but our proxy group, um, they were across multiple time zones. Um, they already had pretty full days. Um, and we also had a pretty aggressive deadline. Uh, so we had to shorten the visual research phase by prioritizing what the big questions were uh, and shortening the amount of time of design reviews that we had with our proxy group. So the big question was, what should the new theme look like? 
Um, we worked closely with our stakeholders to help answer this question. And since we didn't have a lot of time to spend on answering this question, we used an exercise called the spectrum analysis exercise uh, where stakeholders could complete this in their own time by a specific deadline. So you may be asking yourself, well, what is a spectrum analysis exercise? Um, well, it's a great exercise that our team uses to help uh, figure out what the client is thinking when it comes to the voice and tone, look and feel of a website, or in this case, the theme. So what you do is you create a sliding scale. On one end is an adjective that could describe the look and feel of the site. And on the other end is another adjective that usually conflicts with the first. Uh, for example, at the top here, we have formal and casual. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, this exercise uh, only works if both adjectives are positive. Um, if you put a negative adjective up there, stakeholders will avoid it because they don't want their website associated with a, neg a negative adjective. Um, so what ends up happening then is stakeholders put a point on the scale of how they think the design should look and feel. So if they feel like the design should be more formal, they put the uh, point on the more formal side. Um, if it's, they feel it should be more casual, uh, they put the point on the more casual side. Um, the end result is that it forces stakeholders to choose an adjective and it helps initiate some really good discussions around that specific adjective. Often with this exercise, we find that the why is more important than the actual selection. Um, and since we couldn't conduct this in person, um, we used a tool called Envision to uh, conduct this exercise remotely. And it ended up being a great tool to use because um, stakeholders could just click on the link, um, go to the, the web page that shows the, um, the spectrum analysis, they could put a point on the scale, and then other designers and developers and stakeholders could go in and comment on that point, and then it got the discussion going uh, around the why. So based on the spectrum analysis, uh, we identified the following keywords to help establish the voice and tone. Um, so we had formal, light and bright, contemporary, professional, approachable, novel, cool, familiar, and high contrast. Um, we then took those adjectives and combined them with our design principles uh, in order to complete our research documentation. Uh, once we had that complete, we were able to start exploring the visual approaches. Uh, one thing to note is that our team tries to keep the design principles and adjectives in front of mind while we're designing. Um, so you, we'll use things like note cards, post-it notes, white, uh, whiteboards, vision boards, um, things to help remind us about the design principles and voice and tone as we start exploring different visual approaches. So before we actually jump in and start on page design, um, our team uses something called Zoom Mocks to explore different visual approaches to a design. And with the Zoom Mock, what you do is you create a wireframe, uh, then you choose a small section of that wireframe, and then you start exploring style in that specific section. Um, it's an alternative to style tiles or element collages that works better for our team and our process. And usually when we create Zoom Mocks, we create two to four Zoom Mocks each representing a completely different style or variations in a specific style. Um, to learn more about Zoom Mocks, uh, there's an article that I wrote that gets a little bit more specific on what they are and how to use them. So these are the Zoom Mocks or some of the Zoom Mocks that we had created for Olivero. Um, we explored approaches that were a bit more traditional like the ones you see on the left and ones that were a little bit more modern like the ones you see on the right. Uh, once we felt like we had these in a good spot, we reviewed them with stakeholders and they chose an approach to move forward with, uh, with some minor revisions. One thing to note is that our team wasn't looking for an official sign off of a finalized style. We would have been in a much larger feedback loop that the timeline really didn't account for. Um, what we were looking for our stakeholders was more of a nudge of, you know what, this is, this, is, uh, this is a good style. This is something that we really like. Let's keep moving forward with this specific one um, with the understanding that the design will evolve and change um, as we extend it to other pages and components. So once we had our Zoom Mocks complete, it was time to start thinking about the design system. Uh, but before I go in and uh, show the designs, uh, I just wanted to mention some of the tools that we had used to design Olivero. 
our, our main UI tool that we had used was Figma. Uh, Figma allowed us to collaborate uh, much more quickly between Jared and I, uh, between developers and with stakeholders. Um, we used Zoom for conference calls uh, where we had to share work. We used Slack for synchronous communication, uh, Dropbox paper for informal notes. And then for more formal documentation, we use Google Docs. And we use, when we talk about more formal documentation, we're talking about um, uh, specific documentation that needs more detail like a style guide. I also just wanted to restate some of the challenges that we had to keep in mind while we were designing the system. Um, accessibility was our number one priority. Uh, the design had to be WCAG AA accessible. We also had to balance the must haves versus the nice to haves. Uh, some ideas that we had uh, were fantastic in our eyes, but unfortunately they wouldn't have been able to be implemented in time. Uh, we also had to keep in mind who our audience was and their intention. Uh, there's a lot that they could do with this theme and we wanted to give them as many options as possible without making it overwhelming. And then finally, typography. Uh, we had to find a font that used the SIL open font license. So it was compatible with the Drupal.org distribution packaging requirements. Uh, it also had to support a wide variety of font weights and fit with the theme and the overall style of feeling modern. Uh, in the end, we chose Metropolis for our sans serif and Laura for a serif font. So now I'm going to take a uh, small little break here and I'm going to switch my screen share to Figma. And we're going to do a, a design walkthrough here. Um, so usually what ends up happening is if I was giving this live uh, in-person session, I would be actually using for, uh, short video clips, but there tends to be a lag sometimes in uh, video sharing. Um, so I'm going to take you live into the designs in, in Figma and walk you guys through everything. So. so this is a guided tour of the designs that we had uh, created for Olivero. Um, when we had first uh, started uh, thinking about the design system, we focused on two main pages. Um, we focused on the um, default landing page. So this would be the page that users would see when they first activate Olivero. Um, and we also focused on a article page. Um, and the reason why we chose those two pages is because it gave us uh, two opposite ends of the spectrum when it came to content. So we could explore what a page would look like with minimal content versus what a page would look like with a maximum amount of content. Um, so this is the uh, default out of the box experience when you first uh, activate the Olivero theme. Uh, this would be the page that you would see. Um, and one of our main goals with this page was to uh, arrange content in a way that would get users started up much more quickly with using the theme. Once we felt we had that in a good spot, we then uh, turned our focus to an article page. Uh, and what we did is we actually uh, created a mock uh, blog post that touted the new Drupal 9 theme. Um, and this allowed us to work out a ton of different styles that we could extend uh, beyond uh, to other parts of the system, uh, including our typography, uh, how imagery works. So the ratio size with imagery, um, whether or not it floats left or right, um, what quotations look like, um, tables, list items, tags, and what a commenting system looks like. So after we had that complete, we felt like we had a good portion of our base styles um, in a good spot where we can start extending that to, to other pages. Our next step was to focus on the header. Uh, the header had a, it included a lot of functionality uh, and we wanted to make sure that we were designing for that functionality. Um, when it came to the out of the box experience, you could, uh, Olivero came with a uh, one level dropdown. So we designed that dropdown to make it feel more modern uh, and fit with the overall theme. When it came to navigation, we had to think about the types of navigation that users would uh, use with the theme. So, up here at the top here, uh, this is like best case scenario, right? So we have five words, they're pretty short. Um, most likely won't, won't happen when uh, somebody uh, activates and uses this theme. We had to think about what users, what would happen with the navigation if users were to um, add numerous length, 
numerous links with uh, different line lengths. Um, so instead of having navigation wrapped to two lines when that happened, because that can get kind of messy, um, we decided to create a max width with the um, overall navigation. And once that navigation hits that max width, um, it would actually wrap up into a hamburger nav. Um, and then you click the hamburger nav and then you can get um, your navigation appears. Um, so this would allow a little bit more flexibility with navigation um, and gave it more of a cleaner look if somebody was using, you know, 10 links and they all had like 10, 10 characters in them. Another good thing about this too is that it was easy for us to take the style and extend it down to tablet and mobile. One of our goals with the theme was to make it feel more modern. Uh, and we did this uh, with the design, but also we wanted to include some interactions. Uh, so we created this neat interaction where on scroll down, what would happen is that the header would actually wrap up into a hamburger nav. Um, and then the user can click that hamburger nav at any time to um, expose uh, the header. We also had to think about branding. So users would be able to upload uh, different types of logos, word marks, um, or uh, just type in the name of their website. Um, so we had to account for uh, what would happen with the background depending on the type of logo that they would upload. Um, so we created backgrounds that would, um, we created lighter backgrounds that would accommodate darker logos or word marks. Um, and then we also have a darker background option that accommodates uh, lighter logos. Once we had that worked out, um, we started focusing on uh, the mobile experience. Um, and we focused on the header uh, specifically first um, because the header again had a lot of functionality in it, but also when you are on a smaller screen, uh, trying to figure out how branding works along with navigation can be difficult. Uh, so what we did is we, um, we took all the secondary items in the navigation, like the search, log in, and sign up, uh, took that um, out of the default header um, and actually put that into the um, exposed hamburger nav. So as you see here, we have a sign up, log in, and then the search bar appears at the top. Uh, that would appear once the user clicks on the hamburger nav to access the navigation. So this would allow users to have more room for uh, branding up here at the top. Our next challenge was a listing page. And our main goal with the listing page was to increase scannability. Uh, so what we did is we made titles large and upfront and secondary content like descriptions and uh, tags um, smaller. We also had to think about um, the editor experience. So when you're logged into Drupal, um, the editor tabs are actually part of the theme. Um, and we had a lot of great ideas around this, uh, but unfortunately they wouldn't have been able to be implemented in time. Um, so what we did is we just took the default experience and restyled it. And finally, there was forms. Uh, forms, um, forms were challenging for us. And the reason why is because we had to balance accessibility with making forms feel modern and part of the actual uh, theme design. Um, and there was a lot of back and forth with accessibility experts. Um, we are still going back and forth with them actually. Um, I think in the next month or two, Jared and I may tackle forms again because we got some feedback. Um, so there might be some uh, slight changes uh, coming to forms. Um, but we also had to make sure that we were including things like focus states, error messages, um, and hover states, and making sure all of the form elements uh, were fully accessible when it came to the design. So now I want to review ideas that got scratched. Um, this is kind of like the bloopers reel of the pre presentation, um, but I think it's also good to show this kind of because it kind of shows our design process and how things progressed to where they are right now. So as I had mentioned, um, we have our uh, default uh, um, editor tabs. Um, so these are what this is the design that we had actually ended up moving forward with. Um, but we, when we first started designing this, 
um, we had uh, took a much darker approach to the design. Um, but we got some feedback that this was too bold. Um, we also experimented with what would editor tabs look like if they were uh, if they took less of a priority with the uh, overall page um, and they were uh, they were um, in the lower left or lower right hand side and they would be pinned there. Um, we thought that these were both really great ideas because it gave uh, more of the user um, an idea of what the page would look like without having this bar, obtrusive bar going across the top of it. Um, but unfortunately, uh, due to the timeline, we couldn't, we couldn't develop this. Sidebar. Um, so the default theme, um, so Olivero includes a right sidebar um, out of the box. But uh, down the road, we thought it would be nice if users could float the theme either or float the sidebar either left or right. Um, so what we did is we designed uh, the sidebar and then tested it in both ways. So what it would look like on the right side and what it would look like on the left side, um, just in case down the line, they do want to include that functionality. Um, and when they do, um, they would be uh, minimum redesign needed for that. And then finally, we have search. Um, so this is the search bar that we ended up moving forward with. Uh, but when we had first started exploring search, we took a much lighter approach to the search bar. And we got some feedback that it felt more part of the page design and didn't feel like a search bar. Uh, so what we did is we explored options uh, where we would uh, try and make it feel more like a search bar, mostly by uh, introducing uh, some underlines. Um, but we ended up going forward with this one right here because it was the most simplistic and uh, didn't introduce any extra design elements. And finally, I want to review design documentation. So with design documentation, um, our main goal is to eliminate any discrepancies that designers and developers may come across in the design. Um, and the reason this happens is because designers sometimes work quickly. I am one of them. Um, and so you're copying and pasting, creating artboards, changing out styles, uh, either to hit deadlines or to, you know, just quickly experiment with something. Um, and so what ends up happening is when other designers or other developers go in um, at, to the artboards or to figure out what the, uh, what the style is, uh, sometimes they'll find those discrepancies and they have questions about them. Like, is typography supposed to be like this or is typography supposed to be like that? Um, and so what we want to do is we want to create the single source of truth uh, that designers and developers can go to to help answer those questions. So usually with uh, design documentation, uh, we focus on typography, uh, documenting the grid system, uh, styles, scale and spacing, components, and all their different variations. Um, our team creates design documentation in two different spots. Uh, so we'll create design documentation in Figma. And this is usually uh, in the form of styles and a component library. Um, and then we'll create more detailed documentation in a Google Doc. And this will usually create, uh, this uh, Google Doc is usually our style guide, which has details around things like our grid system, scales and spacing, uh, and typography. So I just wanted to show some of the uh, styles that we have put together in Figma. Um, so this is our typography uh, system. And we had actually created styles in Figma for this. So it's super easy to go in and update if needed. Um, but what we usually document is we document our font size, um, line height, letter spacing, and text transform. And we do that for all the different types of typography that appear in the uh, design system. We also document our colors. So these also appear as styles in Figma. Um, and so we have our main colors that we use within the design system, but also some tints of those colors that are associated with that main color. And then we also create uh, components and we add them to the component library in Figma. Um, so we create a component and then all the different states that that component can appear in. Uh, for example, here we have our header um, and this is how it appears by default, but we also have a sticky header, which is a little bit more narrow. 
Um, we have our drop down and then the navigation and all the different states that navigation can appear in. And then what our header looks like when the navigation collapses into that, um, into that hamburger nav. We also create styles for both desktop and mobile. Uh, because of our timeline, we did not have uh, the bandwidth to create those styles for a tablet. Um, but we worked closely with developers to, to kind of work out the tablet style as they were developing uh, to kind of figure out if things were kind of looking off. Um, they'd ping Jared and I and we, you know, hop in uh, a screen share and then we'd make recommendations. And we also document our form fields. Um, so these are also components within the Figma library. Um, and um, we have all the different states for those form fields. Um, so we have the focus state, what it looks like with an error state, um, and then uh, the various other types of form fields like check boxes and radio buttons um, and uh, submit buttons um, and all the different states that those can appear in. So I am going to uh, switch back to my keynote here. Um, because I want to talk about um, what's next when it comes to um, Olivero, because we are in a really exciting time right now. Um, we're actually in the process of going through some usability and accessibility testing. Um, this was something that we had wanted to do earlier in the design phase, but unfortunately, due to the timeline, um, it wasn't, we couldn't fit it in. Um, so we're kind of doing it near the end of the design phase. Um, and we're actually in partnership right now with the National Federation of the, of the Blind to conduct that usability and accessibility testing. Um, and Kat Shaw, who is one of our teammates, is actually heading up that endeavor. And the results have been super positive so far, which make us all really happy. Um, from a development standpoint, we're aiming for a uh, beta level stability so we can include it in the default theme um, in the 9.2 release, which should be uh, June 2021. So right now um, it is uh, included in Drupal when you download Drupal, but you actually have to activate it. Um, so right now it isn't the default theme, hoping June 2021 um, that it will be the default theme. We've been also talking about dark mode. Um, so this was based on requests and feedback and ideas that we had earlier on um, when we had first started uh, designing for the Olivero theme. Um, and so Jared and I will probably be um, jumping into that, uh, uh, into that initiative um, as soon as uh, we can uh, get that started. And then finally, uh, a color switcher for the theme. Uh, so right now, editors uh, don't have a choice on what colors the theme will appear in. Uh, it's in that default Drupal blue, um, but we'd like to give them more of a choice so it fits more with their branding. So the idea is that they would have five different color themes that they could choose from, um, some in a more neutral palette, so that way it works with a wide variety of branding. So um, I guess we have time for questions, which is amazing because sometimes this runs a little bit long. Um, but uh, before we get into questions, I did want to point you to two resources. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Olivero or you want to get involved in the initiative. Um, first, we have the project page, which you can find on Drupal.org. Um, and there you can find uh, the, the history behind Olivero, how it got started. Um, you can uh, access the Figma files that I showed today and learn a little bit more about how to get involved if you're interested in getting involved. Um, we also have a Slack channel um, that it is a good place to go. Um, if you are, uh, if you do want to get involved in the initiative, we do have a stand up that I think happens on uh, Mondays um, where, uh, you know, developers and designers kind of uh, go in Slack and we have stand up where um, people can talk about, you know, what's happening in Olivero right now. So, so I think, I think that's it. Uh, so we have time for questions. Um, so I am going to go and see if anybody has any questions or Jared, if you want you to take a look too. you can submit them using the Q and A tab at the bottom of your Zoom interface if anyone has. Okay. And 
I'm assuming that everyone's actually off looking at the Figma files right now and not <laughs> <laughs> having any questions. So hopefully we covered things well. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. And again, too, if you do have questions or, you know, you do want to learn a little bit more about Olivero, um, you know, feel free to join the, the Slack channel. Um, you know, everybody is, is super nice and like, we're very welcoming and definitely um, if you want to get involved, that would be a great place to get started. So. There is something in the chat. Oh, another question. Oh, in the chat? Oh, let me look here. No, it's just some comments. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do confirm you covered it up so well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Audrey, uh, Roshan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And Maria. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like design systems are, I mean, this, this presentation, it's about a specific design system, but um, I think Jared was digging more into design systems um, a little while ago, because I feel like that's something, that's something that we try and focus in as designers at Lullabot. So 